Thank you, Daniel. Our next speaker is Chris Pike, who's from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Hi, thanks, Liza. And hello to everyone. Sorry, I'm unable to be there in person. Uh, as Liza said, my name is Chris Paikush. I'm at Woods Hole Oceanographic up in Massachusetts, where I am a sea level scientist. Uh, and today I want to tell you about a study I had published just this morning uh, that reports that the rate of U.S. coastal sea level rise has doubled over the past 125 years. Next slide, please. So the, so the motivation for this study came from a report released and commissioned by the U.S. Department of Energy last summer. Um, it was a wide-ranging report, um, but one of the chapters uh, targeted sea level change in the U.S. And I've quoted here one of the key conclusions from that study as it relates to sea level, which is that U.S. tide gauge measurements, the, the data source we use to track historical sea level rise, U.S. tide gauge measurements reveal no obvious acceleration beyond the historical average rate of sea level rise. In other words, things aren't getting worse. OK, uh, and I saw this and I and I didn't really believe it. So I decided to do my own uh, study of this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, the DOE report uh, was based on looking at historical data from just four or five individual locations across the nation. Uh, and for some of the um, some of the, uh, the reasons that Daniel just mentioned, um, you can't really just look at you know, a record here and a record there and expect to have representative results for the entire U.S. So what I did is I took records from all of the available long tidal gauge records in the U.S. So this slide is showing some pictures of different tidal gauge stations in the state of Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, near where I am. And I compiled them all together to, to quantify how much sea level has risen and whether that rate is increasing. Next slide, please. Oops, we're missing a really important slide. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so this is really the take home result of the paper, namely that coastal sea level has accelerated in the US over the past century. So what I'm showing here is a result from the paper. Uh, let me orient you to this graph here. So along the horizontal axis I, on the bottom, I have time going from left to right, starting in the year 1900 and coming up to the present. And on the vertical axis to the left, I have uh, what I'm calling RSL, relative sea level. So this is the amount of sea level change you measure from a point on land, as a tide gauge does. Uh, and this is the average sea level change over the contiguous United States over the past 125 years. That's what's shown year by year in the gray. This is my estimate of the change. It's about 40 centimeters, uh, which translates to about 16 inches. Now that's about twice the rate of sea level rise that we saw on a global average that say was reported in the IPCC report released a couple of years ago. Uh, and just to put this in perspective, when we talk about 16 inches of, of sea level rise, I mean, y'all are sitting down there uh, in Louisiana, 16 inches is, is comparable to the tidal range uh, along the Gulf Coast. So it, you can kind of translate this as, you know, what our grandparents saw as, as high tide, we're now seeing as the lowest tide of the day. So that's what this looks like in real terms. Um, and to some extent, we've known this. What's really novel about, in other words, we've known that sea level has risen over the past century. What's novel about this study is that I'm arguing that the rate of that rise hasn't been constant. In other words, it's been ever increasing. So if you look again at this graph, uh, what I've traced out with the orange line is the uh, essentially the curvature or bowing uh, of that graph. In other words, the, as you go further into the future, there's more of an inclination of that graph to, to be inclined towards the vertical. That's telling us that the rate has increased. And in fact, it's doubled. Uh, the rate was about two millimeters a year back in the year 1900, now it's four. Okay, so we've seen a doubling of the rate of sea level rise in the US. And again, this is, this is important. Again, 40% of the people in the US, you know, almost 130 million people live in coastal counties. So this has direct um, bearing on, on how we live and, and work near the sea. Uh, next slide, please. So just to summarize the main points, I used tidal gauge records, historical data from the U.S. to quantify sea level acceleration. I found that rates doubled over the past century from about two to more than four millimeters per year in 2024. And importantly, that the recent rates that we're seeing now indeed exceed the historical average trend um, of three millimeters per year. Um, could I ask Chris, the DOE report that he mentioned, is there any reason that you could see someone would have picked the stations they picked and got the result? I guess what I'm asking is like, 
there's always disagreement between scientists about different measurements and levels and, and what's happened. Like, is, is the DOE report something that we should put alongside it? Or are you basically saying that that's not a legitimate finding in any way? Yeah, well, I'll say two, I'll say three things. One is I, I can't speak to the motivations of the DOE authors for why they selected those particular sites. Um, but I can certainly say things about those sites and give a general philosophical perspective. Um, if I were to choose a handful of sites that would be most representative of the U.S. behavior at large, I wouldn't have selected the sites they picked. You know, just to take two examples, since you all are down there on the Gulf Coast, two of the four locations they really emphasize are just south of you in Grand Isle, Louisiana, and also at Galveston, Texas. Um, why do I say those are not great sites to pick? Because they're really heavily influenced by processes that are happening very locally. As Roger said, you know, sea level is a complicated thing. A lot of different factors on the earth can contribute to the seas rising or falling. In a place like southern Louisiana, yeah, you're impacted, you know, by things like ocean dynamics, like Roger said. Um, but more particularly, there's been a lot of literature on the influence of onshore oil and gas extraction um, from the subsurface. Uh, and when you extract fluids from the subsurface, you increase the tendency for the land itself to subside and compact. And that feels like sea level rise to someone at the coast. You know, if you're on the coast, you don't care if the height of the sea rises or the land itself sinks. So the Grand Isle tide gauge um, is a gauge that's heavily influenced by vertical motion of the land. Uh, and the rate of that is not constant. In fact, peak onshore oil and gas production in, in the Louisiana area, it peaked around the 1960s and 1970s. So that's when you actually see, if you look at the data, that's when you see the fastest rates. Again, it, it's sort of a, a very large signal that swamps the more subtle um, climate change signal that, that's beneath it. Uh, a similar story at Galveston, uh, it's not oil and gas production there, it's um, changing rates of, of groundwater withdrawal over time that has a similar effect of causing the land to subside. So the, again, the, the point here is that both of those locations um, are subject to a lot of local effects, which yes, there may not be an acceleration at a place like Grand Isle, because of the effects that I've said. And that brings me to the second point, which is probably there isn't any one location in the US that's ideally suited for the whole. So one of the philosophical points I make in this paper of is you get into a dangerous place if you're just choosing a couple of records and trying to extrapolate to the whole. I mean, we're kind of blessed in the US with, with a lot of data records, so why not use it all? So that's one of the main points I make in my paper, which is that you know we've got all these nice long tidal gauge records from across the country, what happens when we put them all together and take an average? Okay, that way we are kind of smoothing out some of those local effects that I, that I just mentioned to try to get at a, at a larger scale aggregate sense. And when you do that, the data is very clear that you see a clear acceleration like I showed. So again, I wouldn't have picked those individual gauges because they're not representative of the large scale. And I'd have to, to choose any small subset to try to make a statement of the whole. I try to take all the data we have average it together and to make that big um, aggregate statement. Thanks.